Good morning. Did you have a good week? All right, me too. Better. I want to welcome you online, if you're watching, to Olivet Baptist Church and our Sunday morning worship. We may have an issue for those of you online that are listening to the music. Uh, we're going to find out today. If you can't hear us, you will get the name of the song and the artist. Just to give you a heads up, everything is normal. It's just that may be a little glitch for a little bit. So, uh, young people, if you want to join us in the corporate worship, want to make you aware of these three songs, listen to the words, especially today when uh, mental health among young people is way, way high. Listen to the words of these three artists and meditate on, on, on them as you worship him. So, let's worship together. Wes? Morning, everybody. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading will come from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. And in that sixth verse of reading, one verse in six says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. May the word of God do a richer in your heart and soul. Our New Testament scripture comes from the book of Revelations, the fifth, the fifth chapter, the twelfth verse. Revelation, fifth chapter, twelfth verse. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise, and honor, and glory, and power, forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come this morning, Heavenly Father, to prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for the worship service. We come this morning, Heavenly Father, to give thee the praise and the glory and to recognize that you are God Almighty. Yes. And the reason why, Heavenly Father, is for you deserve it all. Mm -hmm. Oh, gracious God, you deserve every bit of praise that we could give up, every bit of uh, uh, glory that we could yeah. give you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, you deserve all our worship this morning. For you have been so good to us once again by allowing us to come into your sanctuary and to have a worship service. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for Reverend Ananias that's going to preach the word. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for the deacons for praying. Thank you for the ushers who are ushering. Thank you for the congregation who is worshiping with you right now. Oh, worshiping you, Heavenly Father, right now. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. For we love you, God. We love you, Heavenly Father, for you are a righteous God. You are a, a, a beautiful God, Heavenly Father. You are a holy God. And we thank you and your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Oh, gracious God, we just thank you, Lord, and we come to worship you this morning. For this is the day that you have made, Lord, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Oh, gracious God, we thank you again, Lord. We seek you today, Lord. We seek your goodness. We seek your love, Lord. We seek, Heavenly Father, your compassion and your blessings that you have upon us. You called upon us to come today, Lord. You called upon us to be here to worship you and to magnify your name. So we come to more this morning to do that, Lord. Close, far, near. We all can worship you, Lord. We can all praise you for all the things that you have done for us, Lord. 
And we can praise you, Lord, and we can glorify you because of the things that you're about to do for us in our lives. This day is the day that you made. This is the day that you have created, Heavenly Father. This is the day, Lord, that you have given to us that we one day out of the seven days is that we can magnify you. So, Lord, we come today to lift you up. Lord, give you all the praises and glory. And be grateful that you have given us the strength to do it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. start out with the best one. First, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 makes a comment. This is going to be a thinking moment for you to think of all week. And next Sunday, I will give you the answer. Okay? I want you to stretch your minds a little bit and tell me, well, you can think about what you come up with. Proverbs chapter what is it? 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Obviously, the intelligentsia would be upset with the gentleman that wrote it, but it's the smartest man in the world, Solomon. He got his wisdom from God, and he makes this comment. I have a few questions for you to meditate on during the week and see if you can answer it. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. I think it is, 11.30, Proverbs 11.30. Hmm. Yes, that's it. The second part, reading from the NIV. He who wins souls is wise. Okay? He who wins souls is wise. Here's my question. Why? Why would he say that? What do you think he who wins souls is? You can invert it. Um, he who is wise wins souls. Same thing. So the question is, why? And you can't use the New Testament on this one. You can't say, because in the New Testament it says, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go out and share the gospel. This is way before that. So what's he mean? What's the answer to this one? In a way, it refers to the New Testament, but that's, you can't use it. He's talking Old Testament here. He who wins souls is wise. Why is that? That's the thought for the week. Uh, two more. I told you it was going to happen. Two weeks ago, I gave you an article. A lady wanted to die. And California has a law that allows her to do it. And I suggested, where does it stop? Well, Canada has just opened the door to expand euthanasia. And they killed a person for hearing loss. Oh because they can't hear well, now you can euthanize them. That just happened this week. So, who gets hit the most with a health care issue like this, if you want to call it health care? I'm going to make a suggestion. The poor, the minorities, and the elderly. Here we go. What do you think about that? The Bible, the biblical principle is, thou shall not kill. That's part of the Big Ten. Hmm. But if you remove God, then there's no accountability. And Canada is a socialistic country. Number three. In California, 16 Starbucks have closed. 17 Walgreens have closed. 
Target now is closing at 5 p.m. instead of 10. Why? Well, they're stealing. They're looting. And the police isn't doing anything. Why is that? The biblical principle is the government is to protect the citizens. And when you loot, it leads to violence. Now, why is this going on in California? Just a thought. And that is it for the thinking moments. So let's go. Thank God we get to go before our God and ask him to intervene for us. I want to do the same thing that I did last Sunday. Um, the Lord has just reminded me again to not let it go yet. And that was besides the eight, five names that we're going to be looking at as part of the 800. I want to uh, read a scripture after we do the five names. And we're going to do the same thing that we did last week. That weight that is holding you back on your personal walk with God. Let's see if we can remove it. And we're going to ask again the best counselor in the world that knows our heart to run it through our mind. What are the weights that are dragging us down and keeping us from running the race that God has called us to do? So let's go before the Lord now and lift up our hearts to him and then have the Holy Spirit do his counseling for some brief moments in our personal lives. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you again. What a Savior, man. Over 800 names that describe your attributes. Who would have thought that? Thank you for giving us the privilege to see them week in and week out. And gives us more insight on not just your attributes, but your nature and who you are. And Psalm 72, 17 says, may his name endure forever. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Five more names of the 800 that tell us about you. Isaiah 33, 21 says that you are the majestic Lord. Isaiah 17, verse 7 says, you're the maker. Jeremiah 51, 19 states that you are the maker of all things. Isaiah 45, 18 calls you the maker of earth. And Zechariah 10, 1 states that you are the maker of grain and barley. You are the creator. And it is to you now that we bow our hearts. It's funny, we can go to man and we can go to counselors and get human wisdom, but they're limited. As soon as we pray, we now have invited the creator of the universe, the eternal God, to hear our plea. That's the X factor. That changes everything now. And Hebrews makes a comment, Lord, and we looked at it last week in 12.1. And the author of that book said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run with perseverance the race marked out for each one of us. Now, Holy Spirit, the Bible says that you're the helper, the paraclete that comes alongside 
and counsels and leads and talks with us. Our roommate, who knows us better than we really even know ourselves. So if you hear my voice this morning and you find yourself beginning to love any pleasure better than your prayers, then we need to talk to you. If you love any book better than the Bible, we need to talk to you. If you love any house better than God's house, we have a problem. If you love any table better than the Lord's table and the cross, we have issues again. If you love any person more than the Savior, we have a problem. And if you love anyone better than your own soul, you need help. So, I'm going to ask all of us including myself, Holy Spirit, to run back our life before our hearts and mind right now. Show us everything that hinders or a sin that entangles us that doesn't allow us to run the race freely. And we can confess it to you privately. So Holy Spirit, do your counseling now as we silently wait for you to show us what do we need to drop so that our walk and fellowship and intimacy with the Savior will be better, more fluid, more loving as a result of getting rid of dead weight. Have your way now in these few moments as we silently ask you to counsel us. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for being so honest with us. May we be that honest with you now. To work on things that are, hold us back. The first song that Wes played said it all. Anybody can sing praises when it's all going good. But when it's not, and it seems like you don't move and our trust begins to falter. That's dead weight. Help me to trust you, especially in those moments. And allow me to, to see the display of your power by me doing it and affirming a walk of faith, not by sight or feelings. Who would have known, Holy Spirit, but you? 
for me. Thank you again. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence, a prayer away, that we can have fellowship with you and have you minister to us and we haven't even got to the sermon. What a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll turn it over to the officers for the offering. Thank you, Wes. All right, ready to go to work. I've been chomping at the bits on this one. Uh, they said that I couldn't do more than a couple of messages on the cross. This is number six. So we're going to keep going until we exhaust what we can in terms of what's actually behind the cross. So if you have your Bibles, again, we haven't left the uh, verse that we've been looking at. This is sermon number six from Galatians chapter six. Verse 14, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. One verse reading from the NIV version. You can follow with me in your Bibles. Here's what it states. Paul is writing to this small church, and he makes a comment. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you for life, for the word, for the revelation of it, for the teacher you have provided for every believer, our roommate, the Holy Spirit, who penned through holy men of God, your truth, for the one purpose, to reveal the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask of you again this morning, as you've done week in and week out for us, to illuminate the text, take us into the depth of the truth that we read, and then do your counseling for us. Minister to our hearts. Some may need comfort. Others may need conviction. Others may need a challenge in their Christian walk in terms of stretching them to do more in walking with you. And so whatever it may be, may you have your way, but may every person realize today that they've met the living God through the living word because of the living Holy Spirit, their roommate in them. May you get all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever looked at a picture, a building, and you glance at it, you see it, but you don't see it? You, you see the building or the picture, but you miss the details. It happens a lot, it seems like to me when I'm watching a movie and my daughters go, did you catch that? And I go, no, darn it. How did you see that? And so that's the idea I want you to think about now that we look at things in a general way and a lot of times we can miss the details. Well, that's sort of what we've been trying to do in the last five Sundays. We look at the cross, but now we're looking at details. We're trying. We look at the details of the cross instead of looking at it generally. All of it put a new cross on the building. I wonder how many people, when they drive by, look at it and start looking behind it in the details. It's the very reason why we just read it and. Galatians 6, verse 14, Paul says, Man, I don't want to boast in anything else but the cross. Well, he certainly wasn't talking about just the fixture of a stick up vertically and horizontally. He's talking about the details, and that's what we're after. And we've been doing that by looking at it, gazing at it, 
meditating on it, if you will, the very way that we already learned, that's how you read scripture. You read it, you think about it, you meditate on it, and then the Holy Spirit allows you and I to learn and get behind just words of it. So let's do this for our audience if you just tuned in. Here's what we've been looking at in terms of details from five Sundays. First, your destiny is determined by your response to the cross. Wherever you're going to go after you die will be determined by how you view the cross and your response to it. Second, we saw an absolute truth by doing this. Paul said in Galatians, in this context of the cross, you reap what you sow. You don't want the cross, then you reap in the flesh. And that's where your destiny will be. You sow from the Spirit and go through the cross and accept what Christ has said. You reap eternal life, your destiny destiny. The third thing we looked at is the cross is the center of Jesus's teaching. You want the sermon content? It's the cross. That's interesting. Not do you want to find peace. The cross. You understand the cross and you accept it, then you get peace. I was just handed something from the deacons this morning invited to a conference on how to obtain peace. And the problem was, and we smiled about it, it's from a cult. And look what they bypassed, the cross, and went straight to peace. And the Bible says you can have the peace of God when you go through the cross. But for that, good luck. Number four, the cross is prominent in the scriptures and especially in the apostles' sermons. Look at their sermons. Look what they preached, the cross. The fifth thing, Paul says he boasts in it. Why? Because he got saved by it. And then number six, the cross irritates two groups of people. The natural man who's unsaved, who thinks it's stupid and foolish. In other words, the educated folks, the ones that don't know Christ, they think it's dumb. They think it's stupid. And then it irritates the religious people that want to be religious but are not saved. They don't want the cross. The invitation we got, they won't look at the cross. They know their doctrine. They don't believe in it. Why? Because it levels everybody and tells us what we are. Number seven, 20, 21st century man or woman today is really, really offended by the cross today. You get that natural man or woman today in our culture today, they don't like it. That's why they continually remove it. Have you ever noticed that? Number eight, the cross is an offense to the mind of man. Why? Because the cross says man's a sinner. Oops. That man is by nature evil. Oops. That man is a failure. And he doesn't like that. Why is that? Because man's really prideful. Some of you noticed uh, the other Sunday, which I really, really appreciated the exchange that I had with the person that visited. And in fact, from now on, what I'm going to start doing is drop an apologetic uh, facts when it's appropriate in the sermons, because I, I see where the world is coming from. And I saw some things that were repeated that is worldly philosophy. But pride is a big issue. Let me give you two scriptures. This is still introduction that talks about how God looks at pride. And I, I did not have them for the young lady uh, at that time, but I have them now in a review. So let me give them to you. Proverbs, again, written by the smartest man in the world, Solomon. 
Proverbs 16, verse 5. And here's what it says. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Okay. That's a very, now you see why people don't like the cross. Uh, here's another one. Again, not in your outline, just introduction. Proverbs 18, verse 13, 18, 13. Yes, 18, 13. Now, that's not the one I wanted. Darn it. All right. Uh, it says here, he who answers before listening that is fog. No, no, that's not the one I want. Um, I'll get back to you on that one. We got enough in 16.5. If the Lord detests it, then it becomes a problem. He hates pride. Number nine, the cross is an offense to the natural man's heart, the, where the seat of the emotions the, and, and how he thinks, that is an issue. And let me give you the, the, well, the discussion we had dealt with, is there a difference between pride and arrogance? There is not. So let me give you the truth. Uh, again, two Greek words. I gave it to you in the sermon. Let me give it again uh, for the sake of those that may have listened to the discussion. Two Greek words translated pride or proud. So let me give you the first one, the scripture. First John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, and here's what it states. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lusts of the eyes, and the boasting, there you go, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. And that word boasting, we get the English word swagger. Oh. And the world promotes swag. If you don't have it, something's wrong. Well, now look what it just said. God looks at this and calls it pride and arrogance. Actually, the word means both. Swagger, arrogance, proud. Now let me give you two more. The other word translated pride or arrogance, let me give it to you, is Romans 1 verse 30. Romans 1, verse 30, and then the second one is 2 Timothy 3, 2. So we'll read them both. Romans 1, verse 30, and here it is. Romans 1, verse 30, there's a whole list of what is the picture of fallen man. And if you look at verse 30, he talks about slanderers, God-haters, insolent, and look what comes next, the arrogant and the boastful. Okay. And then the last one is Timothy. Um, chapter, 2 Timothy rather. Chapter 3, verse 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 2. People, these are in the last days. The days we are living in. That's the reference point. People will be lovers of themselves. Narcissistic. That's all they'll talk about. Boy, is that today or what? And then... People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and here's our two words again, boastful and proud. So, you see that that's sin behavior, and it affects the heart, and the unnatural man, the unsaved, doesn't like it. Now, does that mean we are to have our heads down? And this was posed to me. Uh, during the conversation and not be proud of who we are? No, you are proud in Christ and have a God confidence in who you are. And we'll talk about that a later time. It's not my sermon now. So you don't have your head down and say, I'm not happy with me. It's not that. But you don't have the world's approach, which is let me be a bragger, let me be say I'm better than you, let me be arrogant, let me have the swag. No, that's sinful. And look at the world. They promote it. Well, that really helps us if we have a fallen nature. It encourages us to continue to do wrong. Number 10, 
eternity dies. That was such a big one for me. That Jesus is God. He's eternal life. How does eternity get on the cross in a human body and die? How do you kill eternity? It's a mystery, but it happened. Number 11, God the Father is the one that put the Son on the cross. How about that? Before the world was even made, it was the Father. And we learned last Sunday through prophecy that the Father put the Son on the cross. Therefore, guess what? Because they're a trinity, he's there with them. Now that leads us to our theme. That's what we've seen so far in five Sundays. The Wisdom of God, part two. Here we go, Roman numeral number one. We got five points that we're going to look at in terms of detail behind the cross. Roman numeral number one. Look at the cross, and you will see the grace of God. Look at the cross, and you will see the grace of God. Let's define the term. Under A, grace is favor. Shown to people who, in the first blank is, do, or the second blank, do not deserve. Those three words. Do not deserve any favor at all. I give it to you again. Grace defined is favor shown to people who do not deserve any favor at all. And that's the first thing, if you look behind the cross and gaze at it, that's what you're going to find, the grace of God. Somebody showing favor to you and me who do not deserve any favor at all, and that's called grace. Let me give you the scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved. See? You and I have been saved, and we don't deserve any favor at all, but we got it. And then look at the second part. Through faith, okay, you got to believe, but that faith is not from you. It's a gift from God. That even God not only put his son on the cross, but gave you the faith to believe it. That's a gift. You don't have it in your fallen nature. The Bible says you're an enmity with God. He's an, so you don't have the faith. That's why unsaved people laugh at you and I. Because they don't have the faith to believe it. But in Ephesians 2.8, God saves you and gives you the conduit to believe in the Savior? Amazing. That's the first thing when you look at the cross you see. Man can never save himself, but he tries. Man can't save himself from the world. What do you mean the world? I'm talking about the way it thinks. Look at the majority of our population in the culture today, and we ape the world. Whatever the styles are, we got it. Whatever the world is saying, we got it. Whatever the catchphrases are, we got it. And he just goes round and round and round. Some of the stuff I'm learning, and I hear my girl, what does that mean? And, oh, yeah, well, it means this, Daddy. Oh, okay. And you know what? That'll be outdated in about five years. And it'll be on to the next so the worldview, the way the world thinks, you can't save yourself from that. You cannot save yourself from your own flesh. We talked about it the other last Sunday. That try, try to stop doing the things that you know by your conscience are wrong. Good luck. If it's in your own efforts, it won't happen. Believe me, I've tried it. It won't happen. And the third thing is, who's going to help you from the devil? How are you going to save yourself? Well, I don't believe him. Well, whether you believe, don't believe him, that, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't mean he doesn't exist. You can talk that all you want. You can even name it something else if you want. It doesn't make any difference. Who's going to save you from him? 
man cannot save himself from his own misery. If you are listening online to, and you don't know Christ, man, misery is there. Wow. Have you ever wondered why people like the blues? Think about that. Why? Because they relate. That's what they're experiencing. Who saves them from that? Well, you keep trying, if you're listening, as much as you want, you will fail. But God gave the cross and a Messiah to let you become a winner if you decide to. So, despite your condition, watch the grace now, despite your condition and my condition, being unsaved, he gives you John 3.16. And you know what that says, common verse. For God so loved the world, which means humanity in the Greek, all humans, all ethnic groups, that he gave. What was the definition of grace? Getting favor from something you don't deserve. There's your grace, and God gave it to you when you look at the cross. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. For by grace, God gave, and we don't deserve it. Why the cross, though? Couldn't God just forgive us? Let's go to Roman numeral two. Second thing we see when we look at the cross. Look at the cross, and you will see the righteousness of God. Under A, the cross is the place of all places in the universe, where the attributes of God can be seen most plainly. I'll give it to you again. The cross is the place of all places in the universe where the attributes of God can be seen most plainly. For the last months on Sunday, we're looking at the names of God, the attributes. And the cross gives us some really quick. Of all places, you look at it, and here's what you're going to see. The righteousness of God, getting right with God. That's what it means. The justice of God, how God deals with sin. The holiness of God, the Savior that came, the sacrifice that he gave had to be holy, and the compassion of God, that, that grace that he gave us, we don't deserve it. So right there, you see four attributes, righteousness, justice, holiness, compassion. How does the cross show us that? Well, God hates sin. And by the cross, it reveals the attributes. So when you look at it, you need those attributes of his to have forgiveness. What do you mean by that? Well, I can't fix myself, so I need compassion. I need somebody to do me a favor that I don't deserve. Ah, that's called grace. But I need holiness because the sacrifice can't have any blemish in it. And God is holy, the Bible describes him. I need justice, though. In order to be saved, sin has to be dealt with. God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means sin and him don't compute together. So he's got to be just in how he handles it. And I need to be right standing with God. And that's his righteousness. Those are just the four that we're looking at. So in order to fix my problem, I got two options. Go to the cross and get those things. Or go to Barnes & Noble and go to the self-help section and read book after book after book after book. And see if it works. Those are the options. Letter B. The cross tells us God hates sin. Those are the three 
three words in that blank, first blank. God hates sin. That's why he went to the cross. And he can, and the second blank, cannot tolerate sin. So the first blank is three words. God hates sin. The cross tells us that. And he cannot tolerate sin. Why is that? They're opposites. God is holy. Sin is evil. It's breaking a law, if you will. It's rebellion against God. They can't go together. And so the cross is God's way to handle the sin issue. Under B1, this means God must punish sin. Now we're getting close to what the Savior did. God must punish sin. He has no choice and he can't get around it. Why? He changes not. He's immutable. So if he said something, then he can't waffle on it. Under did I do B1? This means that God must punish sin. Romans, proof text, Romans 1.18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I think that's it. Yeah, one eighteen. So here we go. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So you have a holy God, and then you have us. We're sinners. That's what the Bible says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Holy God, and then you have us. What about us? Our minds are polluted. Have you ever thought, let me prove it to you. Have you ever been sitting someplace, maybe in church, and out of the blue, you just get the worst thought? Has that ever happened to you? It happened to me. And you go, whoa, where did this come from? The capability of our mind, it's polluted because we're sinners. We have that DNA. Our hearts are evil. Jeremiah has said it. I have an evil, wicked heart. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to be self-centered. I just heard of a, a, a TV announcer make a comment about a movie star and said, wow, how narcissistic. And I thought, you know what? Guess what? Everybody, humanity is this way. We're self-centered. We do it well. <laughs> you know, nobody. we don't have to learn it and go to school. That's what we do because that's who we are. Us first, and then others. And it's all due to sin. So here's what I want to say, though. And, and I would probably write this down. It's not in your outline, but it hit me this week. Don't think of sin merely in terms of actions. Okay? Don't think of, because we, we, we all tend to do it. I do it too, and I forget. Don't think of sin merely in terms of actions. That would be wrong. And let me give you our statement, letter C. Here we go. What makes sin sin is that it is rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God. So, I'm going to go slow now to explain it. Sin is a matter of attitude. Not just actions. It's sin is a matter of attitude. Let me give you the proof text. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8, verse 7. So here we go now. This will prove my point. I think the sinful mind is hostile to God. It, the mind, does not submit to God's law, God's standard. 
nor can it do so. See it? So even if it wanted to, it can't. And it won't. Why? Because the mind is hostile to God. It's an attitude. See? Not just an action. And it's because man is in sin that he regards the gospel as foolishness. When I first came to all of it, my mind was telling me, everybody here, stupid. What are they saying? What is the preacher saying? What are they talking about? Well, guess what it shows? A mind that was rebellious to God. And I didn't understand it. So I made fun of it to myself. Number two, let me give you the second scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Here's what it states. The man without the Holy Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Why, Paul? For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Why, Paul? Because they are spiritually discerned, and he doesn't have our roommate, so he or she cannot understand it. And that was my dilemma. That's the world's dilemma. This is the trouble with man today. When the Bible says you have this problem because you don't have your thinking right, they go, nah, let me put a psychology book out. That'll give me the answer. So they are ignorant of God's truth and then continue down a road that leads them to a dead end. And so... This is man, his picture. He's fallen, he's perverted. Now you see why the cross upsets people? Who likes to be called that? A fallen creature perverted. <laughs> I, I wouldn't like it. I understand it now because of the cross. And it's all by sin. And the best example I can give you of that is that God did the most glorious thing ever in the universe, taking eternity, putting it on a cross and dying, and man dismisses it today and laughs about it. That is the ultimate picture of a fallen, perverted mind. And we have it today. To the point where the intelligentsia says... In the academic arena, God doesn't exist. So I told you I'm going to give you the apologetics in the next several weeks on that statement by educators that you and I have read in high school and college. And they promoted the statement, God is dead. And now our culture believes it. And that's why God hates sin. Number three, Ephesians. Did I give you Ephesians 2.8? Okay. Ephesians 2.8. Did I did it already on number one? Okay, that's what I thought. Put it down again for number three. Ephesians 2.8. It's the same one I gave you in number one. Thank you, Linda. Um, I mean, here's the problem that I want to focus on. I'm going to go slow on this. How can God forgive any man if he is holy and man is sinful and he hates sin? We are naturally God haters. We just read it. So think about this now. This is the detail behind the cross. How can God forgive you and me? The, he can't. So how does he do it? He just can't say, I'm God. You know what? Forgive him. He's holy. He can't tolerate sin. They're opposites. Look at the dilemma that he faces. 
from a human standpoint. There's no way he can do it. He cannot wave a wand. Why? He doesn't change. He's just. And if you're just, you got to give out justice. So he cannot give you and I a pass just because he's God. That's a problem for you and I. And by nature, we are in sin and we're Here's a universal principle. We are God haters. And for somebody to tell me that they've always believed in God, then they made up a God. Because the Bible says we're fallen. Our mind is perverted. Our heart is evil and wicked. And guess what we naturally do? In our mind, we're hostile to God. So what I see in the cross Watch this, is God's way of solving the dilemma. Here we go. Now he can do and forgive by what he puts on the cross, and it takes us to number three, the third detail behind the cross. Look at the cross, and you will see the wisdom of God. So let's take a look at this one as we work through it. Are you with me? Okay. Under A, it's God's solution to the problem that he saw before he created the world. It's God's solution to the problem that he saw before he created the world. What God saw is man falling. He's an all-knowing God. He already saw it. And so now what he's done is giving you and I a solution. And let's go on to A1. Man was going to sin. And yet God wants to forgive him. You got to be kidding. Think about that behind the cross. Man was going to sin. And yet God wants to forgive him. How do we know that? Well, he came up the plan with the plan before he even made the world. So what does that tell you about God's heart? He loved you and wanted to forgive you way before you were born. How do we know it? He made the plan to do it. How? How did he do that? I was thinking about it this week. Well, he needs righteousness. He needs mercy. He needs holiness. And he needs love. How do you bring those together? How do you bring those together with God haters? And is it possible? The answer is yeah, it is on the cross. He took the second person of this Trinity, gave him a body took those attributes of Christ, put him on the cross so he can combine those and handle the God-hater. That's an amazing thing. The wisdom of God. No wonder Paul brags and said, you know what? You all can talk about degrees. You can talk about how big your churches are. You can talk about who you are. I got one thing to talk about. The cross and Christ crucified. Why? Because it's amazing. It's amazing. God did something unique. Number two here, look at it. God provided a way. God provides a way or providing a way whereby God can remain God and yet forgive a sinner. That's crazy. You, you see this? Uh, you want it again? God is providing a way whereby God can remain God and yet forgive a sinner. What do you mean remain God? means that his attributes don't change. He's holy. He can't tolerate sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. So he, gets to, he has to be just. He's got to give justice. The wages of sin are death. He's got to do it, and look what he came up with, a plan that allows him to be God and yet handle the sinner. 
which takes us to Roman numeral four. Looking at the cross, you will see the immutability of God. Under A, immutability means that God does not and cannot change. God does not and cannot change. Boy, let me give you a scripture. It's not there. I should have put it in. I thought about it after the fact. Jot it down. I know you know it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I know you know this. It's very common. I, the Lord, do not change. That's right. Immutable. He can't move around. He can't waffle on these things. He cannot change. And when you look at the cross, guess what it shows you and I? He didn't. He still has all those attributes, and he's going to handle the sin issue by putting his son on the cross. He doesn't change a bit. Now, that should encourage you and I, if we're Christians, that we can anchor our faith in an eternal truth. God doesn't change. Now, man today, you want me to give you a hint on all this stuff? Man makes up gods, and they change all the time. I'm going to tell you this story. I was in San Bernardino living in there. Before I became a pastor, I was doing prison work for about almost 10 years, 9, 10 years. And I'll never forget this. We were going into a, a prison, and, you know, it's y'all come. I mean, the, the way the state law is... You can have a chaplain that's a Protestant. You got Catholics. You got every cult under the sun show up. They all get to come in. So this particular day, we're in an elevator, and I see a black guy and a white guy. And they're in the elevator, and I walk in. Now they're trying to witness to me. And they're Mormons. And I said, man shouldn't have done this. I'm not, <laughs> I wasn't in the mood. So I looked at the black guy and I said, so when did you become a, a Mormon? And he said, oh, I became a Mormon, um, you know, about four or five months ago. And this is my leader, the white guy. And I said, well, before I respond to anything else, I'm going to ask you this question. What happened to all those other black folks before this year? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, before this year, keep in mind, this was a long time ago. You guys didn't accept blacks. So what happened to all the blacks that died before the change came? And you could have heard a fly breathe in the elevator. And I said, see, homie, you made up a God. And when you make up a God, you don't have absolute truth. You keep changing according to the culture and the circumstances. You have a problem because it's a pretend God. And then the doors, thank God, opened up and I went to wherever I was going. But do you see what happens? Change, change, change. No absolute truth. Not with the God of the Bible. Absolute truth. He said it. I don't change. So God cannot deny himself. That's what's important. And you can see it on the cross. That's why he had his son up there. He did not deny his attributes. The son suffered and yet fulfilled his word. Amazing. What kind of wisdom is that? Where God is God and provides you and I freedom from sin, forgiveness of sin, and he doesn't shift a bit. He's still holy. He's still righteous. He still has grace. He still gives mercy. Amazing. No wonder Paul was geeked up over this. Last one. The fifth thing behind the cross, the detail. Look at the cross, and you will see the love of God to us. 
Now, you know, when people say God is love, they don't even know what they're talking about. You know, they think it's a feeling. Ah, oh, yeah, you know, we love everything. We love evil. Commit a crime. Don't go to jail. We love you. <laughs> uh, now, watch this. Under A, how do you see the love of God in the cross? That's what we want to address. Romans 5, 8. And then we're done. We're almost at the end. Romans 5, 8. How do you see the love of God in the cross? Here it goes. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Here we go. He's answering the question that we just posed. While we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, well, the unsaved like this, well, why can't God just forgive us? He doesn't need to cross. He's God. Well, in that view, you make God really passive, and you make him change his attributes, and he can't do it. When you say God can just forgive, no, 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 you make him inactive. God is not an inactive, passive God. So, if God is love... How does he show it? Well, we learned it. God, in prophecy last Sunday, put his son on the cross. That's called action. That's why God cannot just freely drop a wand and say, oh, you're all forgiven. We don't have to do anything. No, because God has to do something. He has to punish sin. That means he has to take an active move in handling the dilemma for you and I. And he did it. And here's love. Look at Romans 8, 3, number 2. 8, 3, number 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, that means God's standard, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in sinful man. Wow, that's it. You can't say it any better. Here's the love. This is what he did to show it. God condemned sin in the flesh of his own son. That's how he demonstrates and shows his love. Let me give you another one, because I, uh, besides number three, put this one on the side. I threw it out last Sunday in part one. I didn't really read it, though. So this week, I want to do that. Isaiah 53, I just want to read three verses, 4, 10, and 11. 4, 10, and 11. Again, showing the love of God on the cross. Old Testament, prophetic, and here it is. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities, or our sinfulness, and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Ah, and now verse 10 and 11. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. All right, a prophetic statement, condemning sin in the flesh of his own son. Number three, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 21. We're almost out. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. Chapter 5, 21. Here it is. God made him, Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Christ, we might become, here's one of the attributes we looked at, 
the righteousness of God. This is how God can forgive you and me. That's the only way. Now, I'm going to close with this. For years, this verse has bothered me. And this week, I got it. Uh, because we're talking about the cross. So I'm going to close by doing a little brief statement showing the wisdom of God through a verse in John 19, verse 34. I don't know about you, but I've read it. I've heard other preachers read it, and I just didn't understand why it was there. You ever read something like that and you go, okay, well, let's just skip it, you know? But let me read it. I'm, I don't know. That's what I, I'll just skip it. I don't get it. Okay, but that's probably not that big a deal, you know? But actually it is. And the cross has forced me to look at it. So verse 34, Christ is on the cross. And they were getting ready to break his legs like they do everybody on the cross. And the reason why they do that is because those criminals push up from their legs to allow their diaphragm to breathe. So even though their feet are nailed to the cross, they push up from their feet so they can get a breath. Otherwise, they will suffocate. When you break their legs, they can't push. And if they're alive, they will suffocate. Only the Romans could figure this stuff out. It's a horrible way to die. But they come to Christ, and look at verse 34. Instead, one of the soldiers, because his legs, they were getting ready to break them, and they said, oh, you know what? He's already dead. We don't need to break his legs. And in verse 34, instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear. All right, so far so good. Keep reading. Bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Hmm. I'm not a doctor. So what I ended up doing is I found an MD's explanation. You ready for it? Here's what they said. The heart had burst the heart burst and the blood had clotted so there it is the serum is a yellowish clear antibody containing fluid that can be separated from blood when it clots how about that? When you see these movies and people take a knife and stab somebody, it's not blood and water coming out of them. He was dead. The blood had clotted from the heart bursting. And as a result, those antibodies, that yellowish color fluid, came out. So here's what we've got. Jesus' heart literally ruptured. How about that? Because of us. And by the agony of the wrath of God, by putting on him, his son, the sin of man, and that separation from the Father where he couldn't see his face, and the pressure of humanity's sin ruptured his heart. That, my friends, is the love of God for you, a sinner. Now, when you look at the cross, you think I can get this out of my mind now? Christ's heart ruptured for me while he took an active form of dying for me. And the Father punished his Son in order that God, the Father, might not have to punish me and you. Let's pray.
What a move, Holy Spirit. I asked you when we started this series to keep giving me details, details, so that I would never just passively and flippantly look at a cross and keep going. But I would look at the details of it. I can never look at a cross people are wearing now and not think of what you have done these last six weeks. Eternity dies? You do it before the creation of the world because you want to forgive me? I'm not even born yet. You put the second person of the Trinity on the cross and carry humanity's sins and his heart ruptures? What a savior. And you do it so that you don't have to punish me. I pray that we never, ever forget these details of the cross and how you did it. May we never boast in our church. May we never boast in our pastor. May we never boast in the music, in the musicians, in the singers. May we never boast in the who's who in the audience. May we never boast about our size. Means nothing. We better boast in the cross because that's what saves us. What a God. What wisdom to remain God and handle this issue of sin. And what love. When the enemy whispers in our ear, God doesn't love you. May the Holy Spirit, may you take us back to the cross and visualize the rupturing of the heart of Christ himself. Oh God, this week, may we meditate on these five details. May it help us in our walk to be more in love with you. A desire to be more intimate and have fellowship daily. I don't know what else to say, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, next Sunday. Week number seven. Let's do it. Let's stand. I'll dismiss us. Father, thank you again for letting us get the glimpse of your wisdom in your plan. Uh, this is crazy. More and more each week, I just it's amazing to me. Thank God that you are our God. And it's personal. And you know our name. We sang the song. And even if things don't move immediately, we can still trust in you because we learned another principle today. You are immutable. You never change. You are our anchor. 
May we never forget it this week. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, may there be grace, honor, and power henceforth and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week thinking of the cross.